everybody. This is our April 2023 webinar series, Farming with Fungi, and this is webinar number two, which is Fungi and the Future of Farming. So as folks are joining, um, before we get started, if you can, in the chat button, which is down below on your Zoom screen, uh, just tell us where you're coming from. I think a lot of you have been to our webinars before, and there we go. The floodgates have opened. New Zealand was the first one in the, the door today. All right. Oh, yeah, here we go. Now it scrolls so fast, we just can't even read it, but it just, it's all over the world, which is just great to see. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. Again, I think we have quite an international audience today. So let's go ahead and get started. We actually got quite a full agenda for today. Um, but before we get there, let's just talk about the April webinar series. So we've already had webinar one, which is Fungi in the Soil Food Web, and uh, the replay should be available for you to watch if you did miss that one, which it was a, a great webinar to, to take a look at. Uh, today is webinar two, which is Fungi in the Future of Farming, um, and we're going to be looking at uh, mycorrhizae fungi, as a, um, and Dr. Adam Cobb is really going to take us through that journey. And then webinar three, which is Fungal Farming Case Study with Nicole Masters, um, and this is going to be part of our case study from the Cotwood Ranch in the North Nevada Desert. And then webinar four is uh, fungal farming experts meet the fun guys and gals. So these are going to be folks like myself and other consultants that are out there doing the good work and our experience with fungi. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about our kind of webinar attendee guidelines. And everybody will be on muted mode except for the panelists just to make sure we get good audio quality. We usually have quite a few folks here and we just want to make sure there's there's little interruptions. But we do want to be able to interact with you. And so there's really two ways to do that. Uh, if you want to ask a question of the panelists and have it been read and during our Q&A section, make sure you click the Q&A button, which again is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And those are the questions that are going to get uh, reviewed and slated for the panelists to answer. Uh, but we also want you to be able to converse amongst yourselves. And we usually do have a very vibrant chat. And most of you have already accessed the chat by telling us where you're coming from. Uh, but if you want to talk with others in, in kind of the flow conversation, uh, go ahead and use the chat button, which again is at the bottom of your screen. And we want you to enjoy. All right. So our topics for today, uh, farming with fungi. Uh, we're almost done with the introductions. And then we're going to get into fungi and the future of farming. And Dr. Adam Cobb is going to have a presentation that we're going to go through. And then we'll have a brief discussion about our April offer. And then the rest of the uh, webinar is going to be Q&A. And again, if you want to post a question for the panelists, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we expect uh, today's webinar total time to be about two hours. All right, so who are our panelists for today? Uh, let's go ahead and do some introductions. Elaine, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, um, I'm Dr. Elaine Ingham, and I am a soil microbiologist. I'm the person who started all the soil food web schools and um, incorporated and have worked with uh, fungi um, and the whole food web. Where do fungi fit? Um, and it's always blown me away when we talk to people, when I talk to people who are um, in, uh, uh, I love it when my brain goes on hold, um, in academia where when I was a graduate student, I talked to them about these organisms. They just uh, had absolutely no interest because these microorganisms didn't do anything in soil. Yeah, yeah, they've only hung around for what, four and a half billion years. Um, so we've come a long way in understanding how to make really good food. Great, thanks, Elaine. Adam. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, so I have been at the school for over, a little over a year and a half. Um, content creator and science communicator is what I do from a day job. Um, and Elaine, I'm so glad you shared that about um, people's attitudes towards microorganisms when you were in grad school, because when I was in grad school and got interested in mycorrhizal fungi and how they could help us produce not just more food, but nutritious food sustainably. Um, I also had agronomists say, who cares about mycorrhizal fungi? They're not very important in agriculture. And so I'm going to talk about them today because indeed they are. In fact, I would say they're one of the flagships of the plant microbial ecology world. Great. Thanks, Adam. Renald. Hey, um, so my name is Renald Flores and I have uh, created the um, that company fluorescent system after <clears throat> having uh discovered elaine's work 
I guess that was in 2015. And uh, for me, my mission is to actually uh, apply science at an agricultural level, which means making the bridge um, from a farmer's perspective. So then the farmer can fully own and understand and fully own and execute what we call today uh, regenerative agriculture. And, and in all that, of course, the mycorrhizal fungi are a key part of it. So yeah, I'm happy to be here with you guys and, and share whatever I can. Great, thanks for all. Carla. Hello everyone, happy to be here again. I'm Carla. I'm work with the school since the early stages almost for a year now. So it's been an incredible journey and work with Dr. Elaine and the entire school. It's really helped me to be the bridge between academia and the reality in the field. So these webinars is always exciting opportunities to contact all the soil restorers we have everywhere and super exciting to see people from all the planet and especially Brazil. I grew up in Brazil, so it's a special place in my heart. Thank you everyone to be here and back to you, Brian. Thanks, Carla. And I'm Brian Bank. I'll be your host today. I am a solo food web consultant. And really right now I have two businesses. Uh, the first, my consulting business I started, um, my wife and I did, it's called Sprouting Soil. And uh, we've just uh, recently are combining our consulting business with uh, some other folks that you guys might be familiar with, Keisha and Casey Ernst, who are Catalyst Bio Amendments. And they have a consulting business as well. And we've, we've combined forces to make soil matter so that we can tackle large scale projects worldwide. And you know, as far as fungi is concerned, it is one of the most critical components that's lacking in today's agriculture systems. <laughs> and it's something we really, really, really focus in on uh, trying to add back into the soils. So with that said, and, and this are the panelists for today, let's go ahead and get started. So Adam, I think I'm gonna be handing this over to you. And Adam, just to let you know, uh, you're on mute. Okay, I think I've got my slides loaded up. You do, you're looking good. Awesome. All right. All right, I'm really excited to see all the people in the room already. I think more will join. So they're gonna maybe miss my little uh, caveat here. Uh, please give me some time. I actually created this presentation on my own time. I wanted to bring some of my ideas, but it's gonna get a little weird. Okay, people who know me know that I like to go out into some philosophical stuff and I just I'm really excited about the topic of fungi and the future of farming. It's really, I'd say, the future of, of land and soil management writ large, right, including in forestry, in, in ecosystems that are, you know, what we kind of refer to as natural. I don't know if, if, if in the current situation any ecosystem is natural, but let me start with this. The future is something we have to reach towards. It takes effort. It takes, um, you know, time to, to, in space, to reach for what it could be, right? So that's the future I'm talking about is what the future could be. And the only reason I don't like this picture is it's just got one hand because really a huge theme today is that we have to reach for the future together. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about fungi but also about people and what we can do, what we can learn from the fungi. I told you it was gonna get interesting. I wanna talk about this little kids movie. I saw it when I was five years old for the first time. And I recently went back to theaters and saw the 35th anniversary edition of this when it was re-released. I cried twice, not afraid to admit. <laughs> it's called The Land Before Time and let me tell you the, the, the basis of the story right away, because I'm going to touch on this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to this. Um, this will be one of three times that I show this slide, because it, it to me, is um, it provides sort of an allegory for us. These five baby dinosaurs are separated from their families by an earthquake. And because of climate change, there's nothing to eat. So they know that their families which they've been separated from are traveling to a location and they're trying to get there too. And this is the whole story. It's like maybe 70 minutes long, right? 
the place they're trying to get, they call the Great Valley. And they know that it's a location that still has green plants to eat. And so they have to work together and get to the Great Valley. This is the thing I want you to remember because we need a destination, right? We're starting somewhere now. We're trying to get to the future. What does the future look like? What's that destination? What's our Great Valley? I think that one of the characteristics of the Great Valley, the, the big picture is a lot of us in the room today, you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't feel this way to some degree. We're trying to imagine a future where humanity can get the resources that we need, the food, the nutrition, the other materials, lumber, all the things that we need to, to have the lives that we want to live, but without destroying the planet. For the last couple hundred years, humanity has been extracting resources from this living world of ours in a way that's causing pain and damage to the entire biosphere. So let's imagine what that future would look like. And I promise I'll get more granular and practical, but again, give me some rope here to go out on. I know for certain sure that the Great Valley is gonna be teeming with fungi. When we get to the future, it's gonna be agricultural systems, forestry systems, all, all the ecosystems that we need to work to restore they're going, to, they're going to have soil that's teeming with fungi. And the other things in the soil food web, which we talked about last time, fungi are just my favorite. And I'm not scared to say that bias. I, I've studied them for 15 years. I'm really into them. And I, and I believe that they are an essential component, like the whole food web is, that is worth drilling down into and understanding. If you get the chance on YouTube, look up this really short video like two minutes by Richard Feynman. He's a theoretical physicist. It's called Ode to a Flower. And really, I want this talk, especially the first half, to feel like Ode to the Fungi. Because he explains that when he looks at a flower, because of what he knows about the biology and ecology of that flower, he can actually appreciate its beauty in more dimensions. So look at this Amanita muscaria mushroom. It's beautiful, just aesthetic, just wonderful. If I saw this in the forest, I'd take a picture and put it on Instagram and be so happy. But when you know that this mushroom lives in a constant relationship with a nearby tree, like a pine or a birch tree, when you know that it's mycelium, it's, it's hyphae, have been reaching out and collecting nutrients from the soil and trading those nutrients with that tree to get carbon, to get food, it just enhances your understanding of how beautiful this thing is. And because I'm going to talk about humans and the way that we do our society, we also can learn from the cooperation of these organisms. The wonder, they trade resources that they each have in abundance and then they end up more they end up being able to grow larger or, or produce more just from sharing. Okay. I studied a different kind of mycorrhizal fungi when I was in grad school. And it's one of the most widespread and important uh, relationships in agroecosystems. Something like 80% of plant species um, associate with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And I'll probably just call them AM fungi today. The first thing I want to mention is that they're typically highly beneficial, not only to the plant, which they help gain, they, they help the plant get access to more nutrients in the soil and more water, and they can protect plants from pathogens, but also to the soil itself. They, they help structure the soil system, and, and I'll mention that more later. Because of this, they're very globally widespread. Almost any ecosystem you go into that has plants will have arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi in it. It's a very ancient symbiosis. We actually, we see so many plants have this relationship because it's been essential for this to become the, the planet of plants, right? Plants are one of the most, uh, but in a biomass basis, I believe there's no other tree, no other part of the tree of life that has more biomass than the plant kingdom. But the, the mycorrhizae are facilitating that. In fact, I've mentioned uh, a paper 
there at the in the bottom corner. Um, I really suggest you look into this. It's 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 amazing. Uh, my this is a peer of mine, Dr. Stevens. Uh, he went to the Serengeti and did measurements of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and the biomass of the grasses and did all this complicated cool math that I don't even understand. And the take home message was without AM fungi in the Serengeti, there would be half as many animals, right? They facilitated the, a doubling of the number of wildebeests and lions and zebras and all these things, right? But here's the wild thing. AM fungi are very sensitive to disturbance and our agricultural systems, the majority of them are full of biological disturbances. So we need to talk about a future where we get the disturbance out of these systems. We change the way that we manage them so that AM fungi and the entire soil food web can thrive. Uh, I think it's worth showing a couple of pictures to really drill this point home. Uh, this paper uh, that's on the left, they had, a, they had a figure. I really like it because it shows on the right side of this figure, a plant colonized. This is, this is a term, I don't really love the term colonized, but a, a plant in relationship or associating with AM fungi. And you notice this gray area around. This is kind of what we would call the rhizosphere, typically, the, the, the soil and proximity roots, but it also typically uh, is depleted of nutrients, available nutrients. And even though we have the poop loop and we have bacteria and other organisms that are, are hel they're, they're helping to make more nutrients available all the time, every day, every moment of every day, the demands of the plant are often not met just by its root system and just by the soil that it's in contact with. It's just a, a, a matter of like, it can't fill its tank fast enough based on the amount of nutrients nearby. So it has to link with things like AM fungi, and that's represented in these pink threads. I mentioned this last time, this is the, the, the mycosphere. There's the rhizosphere, there's the mycosphere. The, the fungi reach further into the soil, and then bacteria and protozoa follow the hyphae. That it, it, it makes the, the, the part of soil which is actively bursting with life larger. And this is a picture I took of some alfalfa we grew when I was at Oklahoma State. In the back, you'll notice very tall alfalfa. In the front, you'll notice very sad alfalfa. This was the same variety, the same soil, the same greenhouse. What's the difference? We knocked the AM fungi out of these pots. We tried to leave everything else, all the other organisms, but just the, the, that facilitation that AM fungi make resulted in something like 600 more, 600 percent more productivity, right, as compared to these poor little guys over here. So it's a mutualism. Both partners are benefiting. The trade, as I mentioned before, is carbon. Plants typically, a lot of them, have an excess of sugar because they're photosynthesizing, and they're free to share. Sometimes Some estimates say like up to 20 percent of that directly with AM fungi because the AM fungi help them get more phosphorus and zinc and ammonium and everything they need to, to increase their above ground tissue and, and capture more sunlight, right? It's a virtuous cycle, it's a mutualism. So I wanna mention a couple other really exciting fungi related um, research projects that are out there. This one last year, they linked plant and, and AM fungal richness. Uh, what do I mean by that? Richness is how many species did they find in an area? More species equal greater richness. This was done in Indonesia, I believe. And so they had rainforest nearby with like 16 or 17 tree species or plant species. And then they went all the way down on a gradient, fewer and fewer and fewer until they got to like palm plantations, palm oil plantations with one species right, monoculture. As the plant richness diminished, so did the AM fungal richness. We've, we, we, they, they, this is done with molecular techniques, then there's a lot of controversy around that, but I still think that when they give us information about the AM fungal taxa, it tells us something. And this tells us that the, the more plants you have, the more um, above ground biodiversity, 
the more below ground biodiversity you can have in a system because those plants are making different exudates they're 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 calling to the fungi to different species of fungi that that perform different functions and this would cascade through the entire um soil food web this would be true of bacteria protozoa nematodes in all likelihood above ground and below ground they're linked okay why does that matter a different project in china linked that same metric plant richness so they looked at kind of mature old forests that had a assemblage of plants that maybe 16 species right and then they went to like lumber plantations where there's one species it's monoculture and they said hmm the more diversity of plants we have here the more carbon gets stored in that system we talked about this last um webinar that fungi facilitate the retention of carbon in the soil as they entangle soil particles and as they lay that carbon into their own tissue it's very resistant to rapid decomposition and so a fungal dominated system with lots of especially diversity of fungi is it, it's it we're seeing this trend over and over and over again in the world that it's it actually confers more benefits to us right because we don't want to live in a world where the atmospheric concentration of carbon goes up to 500 parts per million. It's going to be a rough world to live in. We want to draw that carbon down. So we need these diverse ecosystems. Okay. We mentioned the hollow biont before, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to talk about it again today, because in reality, it's not just a fungal future, it's a hollow biont future that I'm talking about. What does that mean? A hundred years ago or so, people really just said plants are plants. It's one thing. And then over time, you know, we've had about 50, 60 years of accumulating data on just AM fungi. We're like, no, it's plants and fungi. They, they link up their partners, like I've talked about today. And then Elaine started to have this important uh, message in the world since grad school to now. that it's like, actually, it's huge. The amount of species in there is massive, right? We're, we're uncovering more all the time. Like, I think I said this last time, maybe we've, we've, we've described like 150,000 fungal species. And some estimates say there might be 14 million of them hanging out out there on the planet yet to be discovered. So there's just this beautiful complexity. Another example of a hollow biont is coral. There's the coral animal and there's the algae. And when you mingle these organisms so intimately across so much time and they become so reliant on each other, it's not the right choice to treat them as separate organisms anymore. They are a community organism. It's the basis of the holobiont. And I have to introduce this term as well, the hologenome. So I'm gonna talk about crop breeding a little bit. For a long time, we've said we're plant breeding. Well, I'm going to say we actually need to hollow genome breed. We need to understand all these associations, all the genetic variability in a healthy soil system and make plants that are effective in those conditions. I took this picture in Kansas in the tall grass prairie. And it's amazing to think that at one time there was something like 40 to 60 million bison roaming around the central parts of North America. And there were millions of indigenous people that were able to live off of the bounty of those animals and do very little um, active management or they wouldn't, they, they would never fertil like have to fertilize the prairie to get productivity. They might burn it and do some other, you know, landscape level um, management systems, but it ran itself because of hollow biomes that when you go into any of the grasses or forbs in this system and you pull that up and you figure out what's in the roots it's the soil food web it's the association between the microorganism and the plant this is what led to that ecosystem productivity and stability and i've referenced my phd advisor's paper in ecology letters from 2009 because she was able to 
set up a long-term experiment here at this location where she artificially manipulated the abundance of AM fungi, just AM fungi. And as that, she, she, she measured what we call hyphal density, how much hyphae was in the soil. As that diminished, the stability of the aggregates of the soil plummeted and the storage of carbon in the system went down, right? So this is just another example of if you break the holobiont apart, or you hurt one member of the biological community, it can cause systematic really failure, right? Or at least diminishment. Well, I'm here to tell you an unfortunate thing is that in many of our agri ecosystems, <clears throat> our holobionts are in dysbiosis. What do I mean by that? That's a medical term. If you as a human, you live as a holobiont in association with your gut microbiome. And it helps you digest food, it's part of your immune system, it even produces a lot of serotonin, so that part of mental health is gut health. It, we're, we're, this is at least the prevailing theory right now. If something changes in your diet, or maybe you have to take a lot of antibiotics, your gut microbiome can get into what they call dysbiosis, where certain uh, members of that community uh, decline and uh, and other things grow or bloom. One of the things that can happen is you can get an overabundance of something called C. difficile, and people die from that, right? It kills the human when their microbiome is that out of balance. I did this research in, in Zambia in 2018. Well, I, I went there in 2014. <laughs> it took us a few years to get this paper done. And I went to a local grassland and said, what if this represented a more intact holobiont, right? That, 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 that it hasn't been tilled, it hasn't been fertilized, it hasn't been disturbed deeply. It's much more what the native state of the soil would be. And then I took that abundance of AM fungi and I compared it to any of the even small scale farms in this village. 50% less AM fungal biomass. Our agricultural systems are in dysbiosis. We have lost this very important um, set of organisms. And in fact, it's not just abundance, it's diversity. Time and time again, when people study agricultural systems, they say the diversity has dropped off. The diversity of the organisms has dropped off. We've lost things from this system and the key functions that they provide. So there is no future without holobionts. That's my thesis. <laughs> there is no future without them. We need them. They have to be part of the Great Valley, the thing that we're moving towards. Um, or we live in absolute peril. Our whole society, the, the, you know, look at what it does when you have problems in the world, like in Syria, drought and people being hungry really was the spark of a huge crisis years ago. And we could, 2 billion people could face that in the future. What is it going to do to us if we don't get the hollow biomes back into these systems and get the entire, help, help the entire planetary life apparatus have wellness again, instead of being the biggest source of dysbiosis in the, in the biome, right? You can tell I get passionate about this. So this picture, I showed it last time as well. It, it's really neat because you see this packed in hyphae around the root. And these are some of the spores that the AM fungi are making. Imagine a pathogen trying to get to this root. It can't. I, I, like, there's armor. If we break this hollow biont, though, if we reduce the AM fungal bi biomass, we have more disease in our crops. This is a runaway negative cycle that can happen. Okay, so what disrupts holobionts? Most of the green revolution practices that are so common today, high rates of fertilizer, especially phosphorus fertilizer, is very deleterious to AM fungi. Tillage, it's like a direct physical death caused by excessive tillage. Um, leaving land bare, they can only get their food, the fungi, the AM fungi can only get their food from a host plant. So if there's a period of time where you have nothing growing in your field, they're not being fed. Monoculture, 
I mean, I, the list goes on and on and on. And, and the foundation courses do a great job, Elaine, of explaining how we got here, how the history got so screwed up with the way that humans perform agriculture. And sometimes each little step seemed logical until boom, you've just turned the soil into dirt. And dirt is not a place where AM fungi thrive. And so we miss a lot of those opportunities. Uh, when I was in grad school and as a postdoc, I wanted to see if there was also a plant genetic component here. And um, I don't want to beat up on breeders too much because I think breeders are very important uh, and they do great work in many cases, but it's about unintended consequences. And by the way, I had some data slides and my coworker said that I should take them out and I agree. And plus, I've presented them like a million times, so I'm sick of them. <laughs> the paper that this data that these data are in is listed down there. It, 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 was, it was the first paper that I produced from my dissertation. But I actually worked with folks at the USDA on this project. And we tracked not only um, how the AM fungi were relating to different, um, in this case, sorghum bicolor, grain sorghum varieties or genotypes, but how that translated all the way up into the nutritional quality of the grain. That was kind of the novel thing is we, 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 we went from soil all the way to like a human nutrition component. And it's not good, y'all. <laughs> the modern hybrid genotypes that we looked at, the commercial um, sorghums, like a third of the capacity to host AM fungi in their roots. And without a lot of fertilizer, they were fertilizer dependent. Without a lot of fertilizers, they didn't even produce much grain. And it was low quality if they did produce any. Why is that? Well, if you breed for generations and generations of crop cycles, um, in high nitrogen and phosphorus environments where you've artificially done sort of the green revolution thing and bumped your nitrogen and phosphorus to high concentrations, it kind of seems to make the plants a little lazy. They aren't, they aren't sharing carbon with the AM fungi. They aren't even maybe signaling. This is our hypothesis that they have to signal. They have to talk to each other and maybe the plants stop doing that because accidentally we gave them everything they need and they're like, we don't care about the fungi anymore. So then in this paper, a few years later, we actually worked with a breeder to um, have different breeding protocols to think through the microbial ecology to reduce the fertilization of the plant, to make it invest more in this relationship, upregulate the signaling process and, and manage that agroecosystem different. It was a different crop, by the way. It was switchgrass or panicum virgatum. But the really neat thing is that we found that if you hollow, if you do your breeding with the mindset of the hollow genome, you can actually increase the cooperation between plants and microorganisms. Think of AM fungi like one of the key indicators of the entire soil food web, or like a canary in the coal mine. They're, because they're so sensitive to disturbance, if they are disappearing, probably everything else is too. And so, you know, this is really what we envisioned um, is in, instead of having this broken signaling, what if we, the humans, with breeding, with agroecosystem management, with how we amend soil in, in systems and how we manage it, what if we co-create a future with the holobionts, right? So, what does that look like? One of the reasons I'm here is that we're doing two of the three things right here at Dr. Lane's Soil Food Web School. We are teaching people how to bring in biological soil amendments, how to make them, how to deploy them effectively, and how to improve the diversity and abundance of the soil food web. We are also helping people align the regenerative management of their landscape with the soil food web. So you don't you aren't just putting the things back and then killing them again with tillage. You're changing those management practices. It's a very important piece of synergy. But to really move towards holobiont smart agriculture, I'm not saying we should do this, by the way, because I don't want to do crop breeding personally. <laughs> but we need to partner. 
we need to, to to spread this message and i have found some people that are trying this now some plant breeders to say what if we bred these plants differently so that that third component of what the great valley looks like that the hollow genome is being enhanced that the that the microorganisms are being returned and that the land is being managed regeneratively i i, I just see synergy here i see this is this is what the great valley looks like this is a little bit of a map to what we're what our destination needs to be hollow biome smart agriculture okay let me break this down into practical steps a little bit and then we'll go on to and maybe even a little weirder part of my talk but i think it all ties together oh, i hope everybody agrees afterwards how do we move towards this future it starts with our mindset agroecology what there's 600 people in this room over 600 people in this room agroecology says each of you has to put yourself at the center of the process and work on your own mindset and work on your own knowledge pool and see yourself as the investigator of something that we we can help you here at the school we can teach you principles we can help mentor you in this process but you have to take responsibility for your garden, for your land. You are at the center of the story. The future will not happen there without you. One of the things we're gonna talk about is minimize that biological disturbance. If you're tilling, if you're using pesticides, monoculture, we need to find different tools, regenerative methods, instead of these destructive methods, these things that poison and destroy the soil food web. On the positive side, you need to maximize your above and below ground biodiversity, right? That's genetic richness, like maybe not growing the same variety of crop all the time. Species richness, having multiple things, animals, plants on that land, because that richness that I, I showed it earlier, there's that supports below ground richness, that supports carbon storage and other ecosystem services. And then disease suppression goes in here because Elaine has taught for years that if you have a thriving, diverse soil food web community, they inhibit, compete, consume the bad guys, the things that could destroy our crops. And by the way, if they're improving the nutrition of the plants that they're living in, in association with, in association with the plants are, they have stronger immune systems too, because we can't stop the pathogens from existing. A bird flies over your field and you might have a pathogen get in there. The wind blows and spores may come in, but we can create an environment on your land that is disease suppressive. If it lands there, it gets gobbled up. It gets inhibited. The plant just says, I, ha ha, I've got armor. I don't care that you live there, right? This is, the, this is the future instead of spraying things and killing things, sterilizing pathogens is not the future. It's disease suppression. And part of that that I have to pull out here is there's going to be a lot of soil organic matter in the future. There's going to be a lot of hyphae, a lot of fungi, a lot of everything. And there's going to be a lot of organic matter because organic matter in association with an intact soil food web is going to help optimize the plant's photosynthesis. What it needs, right when it needs it, in abundance, right in its root system and in the mycosphere, there will be the nutrients that will make that plant efficient at photosynthesis. Every piece of sunlight energy that hits it can be utilized. It'll make more carbon. It'll feed more fungi. The fungi will expand the soil food web. It's a virtuous cycle. That's going to be the basis of hollow biome smart agriculture. Okay, I want to take a breath here but I also need to finish this off. And I think I only have about 15 more minutes. Is that right, Brian? Okay, let's go back to the land before time. We know our destination now, that fungal future of agriculture, that hollow biont supportive agricultural system and really land management writ large. Now we need to find the pathway. These five baby dinosaurs had to overcome conflict overcome obstacles and threats like the T-Rex that they finally vanquished here to get to the Great Valley. We know our destination, we need to find the way together. 
right? We need this, we need a pathway. And maybe it's not as direct as we think, right? There might be some obstacles we have to go around. How do we do that together? What happens is when two or more people get together is that they have different ways of knowing truth. This is a philosophical discussion that I'm gonna have for just a few minutes. Epistemology is like the art of knowing things, the frameworks that we use, that we bring to the table. Why is this important? My chief framework for knowing truth for 10 years of my life was science. And I'm not gonna say anything bad about the scientific process because I think it's very critical. It's one of the most important, effective, powerful things that humanity has ever developed. And I trust the scientists more than I trust people who aren't scientists about things like, I don't know, epidemiology that comes up in society, right? By the way, I have to take an aside here. The idea that scientists are in a global conspiracy is so laughable, you all. If you get eight scientists in a room, they have 20 opinions. They're so cantankerous where we can't even choose where to have lunch sometimes when we get a bunch of scientists together. How could we deceive the whole world as a unit? It's just impossible, right? But the conspiracies I believe in are things like human bias and greed and other distortive mechanisms that get into institutions. And so science is not perfect because science is run by humans. And this is one of the things that happens. This happened to me at university for a long time. And I really appreciate the people here, Carla, Brian, Elaine, I appreciate all of you because you've helped me break out of this limiting mindset in the last year and a half. I was taught the answer has to be here in this territory. The answer has to be found in the scientific mainstream dominant discourse. The culture of science is the only thing that can deliver the answers. And then I went, but, but, but <laughs> what if the answer's not there in that little territory you've drawn? And like, sometimes the circle of a lab is really, really teeny tiny. They're like, even other labs are wrong, we're right right? The, the pride and the blinders that come along with that. So I like this Isaac Asimov quote, science doesn't even promise that everything in the universe is amenable to the scientific process. The reductionism, the artificiality that comes into experiments can actually distort our view of what's true. I don't think it does that in the process. I think it does that because of the humans. And this is one of the basic things. And by the way, Regenerative agriculture is not immune to this, and I see it. I see it. Conflict because of the human tendency to have a tribalistic way of seeing the world. I'm in the in group, you're in the out group. We're right, you're wrong. We're practical, you're abstract. We, we have the universities, you're the fringe, right? But it happens in, inside of every group of people too. You just split it down further and further and further and you get conflicts and we never reach the Great Valley. The little baby dinosaurs fight all the time and they don't get to the Great Valley. So what do we do? Well, I'd like to say the alternative is that we learn from nature and we celebrate the ecotones. These are the areas where different systems meet. These are places where grasslands and forests come together. And stuff happens there that's so special. The biodiversity there is so unique. And we, 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 can, we can learn from this. I've been learning from this, from this amazing human being. Robin Wall Kimmerer, I highly recommend her book. She is a, a member of an indigenous people group from North America. She's a scientist. A lot of people think indigenous knowledge and science are not compatible, right? And she says, wait, they are because of the ecotone. If we find the overlap between these things, it can be much, much more beautiful. She says they have elements of each, but they also have things that only live there, the ecotone. I'm trying to do this. I'm, I'm reaching out. Carla has seen this with me. I'm like, teach me about something I don't know. Teach me a new way of seeing the world because I think that, that, that this is the answer. This is part of the answer. This is how we find our path. And in fact, our soil regeneration summit this year was the best example of the ecotone epistemology. 
we brought together people who represent wildly different ways of seeking truth and we put them on panels together and it's wonderful because the overlap of these four ecotones is a magical place for us to live as a community where if somebody says it's only science we say that you're telling us to go one direction and we'll never find the great valley if we only go one direction and then other people say well we should listen to the experience of farmers yes they don't they, it's not the only thing that matters but it matters or over here in like ethics discussions and weird stuff that adam's into and maybe everybody else is getting bored i don't know that's important too we have to have the space for those things the traditional and cultural food systems they're what got us here the last 200 years have been the weird time of human history Grow, having 2% of the population of the US grow the rest of the food for the rest of us, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And if we look back at even at my lineage, people that came from Ireland and England, they had cultural and traditional food systems over there that were totally different. We need to learn from that. Okay, so I found this paper that talked about pluralism in AI development, artificial intelligence development. And I, I wanna take a piece of their paper and reformat it a little bit for us. What unites us is a belief that a strongly articulated pluralist project for the future of soil regeneration will be crucial for avoiding the perils of misleading pathways, right? If we just listen to one voice, if we don't have diverse group of people in our community, we are going to go the wrong direction. And we're going to miss the Great Valley. I'm convinced of that. We need everyone at the table. But that's tough. I'm, I'm almost done. Just a few more slides. Because there's a lot of marketing out there that's going to offer you a simple but deceptive pathway. Just listen to this charismatic leader. Just believe in this one option. That's a cult. That's not a movement like regenerative agriculture. That's a cult. Simple and deceptive. It might look like a nice road, but it's not taking you to the future you need to go to. I'm saying we have to grapple with the complexity because it's more authentic. The path will wind. It will be difficult. If you watch the land before time, the little baby dinosaurs didn't go straight to the Great Valley. They had to overcome a lot of obstacles. We can do that together. We can do that together. So how do we find the pathway? We welcome the disagreements. We, we create an in plural, uh, inclusive and pluralistic community. And we ask anyone who has power inside of this movement to share it. They get a voice. Their perspective matters. Everybody else's does too. We can't have 10,000 people in a room talking all at once, but we need to facilitate these kinds of activities. We also need to identify and address sacred cows. This is part of that group think that happens where people say we can't question X. This, this, is, this is part of our identity. Now, no idea is flawless. No person is perfect. Um, I, I think Elaine and Carla and Brian will know that if I'm in the room and I don't think somebody's not right, I say something. <laughs> in fact, I'm trying to be more diplomatic every day. We can cooperatively build protections against tribalism. When we recognize that it's in all of us, that we aren't running from a T-Rex that's external to us, but we are part of the T-Rex that's coming after ourselves and this movement, we can learn to protect ourselves from those cultish behaviors and ask ourselves those important questions. Dee Dee Pursehouse does a great job of this, saying this is the framework for how you, you learn to be introspective as a group about your own dynamics. And then finally, it's just recognizing we're smarter together. If, if, if I just came in here and said, I don't care what Carla thinks, I don't care what Lane thinks, I don't care what Brian thinks, this is the answer, I'm a narcissist, blah, 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 I'm gonna be way dumber than if I do the messy but fun task of like grappling with different things and trying to say, oh, Elaine says this, I don't, Twice yesterday, Elaine, you and I were like, well, we don't exactly see it the same way. Let's talk about it. And then we came to consensus. It was wonderful. So we got to enjoy the, the, the process, even though it's messy. And then we, like these little dinosaurs, can reach the Great Valley. The future can be ours. So let's, let's use this map. The, the map is, is pretty well defined at this point for the regenerative future. 
and let's find our, our, our pathway together to this fungal future. That's, that's really what I wanted to bring today. So thank you for giving me the space to do that. Adam is always fantastic. I really love how you blend in the science and the theory and the cultural practice. Fantastic. One of the best talks I think you've done so far. So kudos to you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, we've got a lot more to do in our webinar today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen out. Um, give me one second here. And we are going to talk about our April promotion and then we're going to get into our Q&A. All right, so let's talk about, oh, I forgot to do one thing. My, my apologies here. I have to optimize for sound when I share this out. Oh, I did, okay, we're all good. So um, our spring board plus offer, which is going to be uh, for April, is a large savings on our FC courses. So it's a total of 47% off. And the, the offer is going to end on April 26, 2023. So it's coming up soon. And um, so if you're interested, this is really a good time to be able to take care of or take opportunity of this offer. So let's uh, watch a little video about uh, our April promotion. We are talking about the soil, we are talking about the base of everything. Even our health depends on the health of the soil. All the sickness and disease leads back to where you live, how you live, and, and what you eat. People don't want to use the chemicals, but they don't have any other way. It's not a desire problem, it's a knowledge problem. Everyone needs to have some awareness of what our Earth is experiencing right now and how we can make a big change. I find that this information hasn't been taught to me and I had to get off my high horse and even though I have a PhD I feel like I'm totally undertrained. I feel like I'm learning more with this program than I have with in-person classes in the past. I've taken classes on microbiology before but this course really makes a difference in the way that a story is put together that unveils the relationships between plants and all those beneficial organisms that we just cannot see without a microscope. If you're looking for something that does a deep dive into soil biology, this is it. It is just an incredible knowledge base and is really relevant to what's going on right now in the world. Without it, the only way I could have gained this knowledge would have been by dropping my life and going to graduate school. And that just wasn't realistic for me. But Soil Food Web has made it possible for me to build a meaningful career in land restoration. I was really nervous that I was gonna put quite a bit of money down and not get that bang for my buck. But once I actually got into the FC courses, I was incredibly impressed with how professional they are and actually the level of education you receive. This is the career path I've been looking for in the biological community and I was having trouble finding. Buen dia. Salam. Ciao. Bula. Wagwan. Bonjour. Merhaba. Kamarjopa. What if this? Kia ora. It's absolutely amazing to me that there's people with their same approach to life wanting to do better things all over the world. What the course is doing is actually getting those people together. We don't have enough. In terms of the connection to the network, I have found just an environment of camaraderie and cooperation. They want you to succeed and they bend over backwards to give you all of the resources to have you succeed. At the Soil Food Web School, we train farming professionals and ordinary people who are passionate about the environment. Our students are able to help make a real change to the way that food is grown in their communities and to how the earth is being treated. Spring is in the air, and there's never been a better time to launch your career in soil regeneration than right now. With the Springboard Plus offer, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses for just $2,900, and you'll get two free bonus courses, saving an incredible $2,600, or 47% off the regular fee price. This is the final time that the Springboard Plus bundle will be made available at this price. Financing options are now available, so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. And remember, the Soil Food Web School offers a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're not completely satisfied, you can get a full refund in the first 30 days, so long as you've watched 32 lectures or less of the foundation courses. 
Start your new career in soil regeneration today. All right, uh, we're going to move into the Q&A, but uh, we hope to see more of you join our Soil Food Web classes and see you on the webinars and the forums that we have. So with that being said, panelists, uh, you guys can go ahead and go off mute and we're going to get into our Q&A. So the first question is from Isaac and Isaac asks, I know how to identify the soil, soil microorganisms, but how do you calculate the biomass of the different kinds of microorganisms in the sample? Well, basically the reason what you have to have there is a microscope. You have to have the measuring tour, tool. Um, and so if you know what the um, eyepiece that you have, the objective that you're using, and so how large is the field of view that you're actually looking at using that microscope, um, you can measure the whole width. You know, it's going to be 10 micrometers or uh, five micrometers, something like that along those lines. So you actually have to get a stage micrometer in order to um, determine what the length of that or the width of your field of view actually is. And some people like to take little strings uh, at that magnification that they're using. So they know at that magnification, they use this length of the of the string to man <clears throat> to uh, draw along the um, the path of the fungus or the bacterium, whatever size it is. Most bacteria, for example, are one micrometer round cocci. So you do have kind of a standard that you can look at. Um, but then all of the other things, you have to actually be measuring the length and the width. And then we have um, the values for what is the biomass per bio volume of your um, or microorganisms so you can determine uh, bio mass. It's a little convoluted. So if I'm totally confusing you here, you're going to have to come and take the foundation class. I get this all the time, Elaine, because when I, uh, I generate soil reports and I'm going from my clients, and it's kind of funny because sometimes my clients will, I'll tell them, you, we saw 411,000 total protozoa in your sample. And they're like, you didn't count all those. <laughs> no, no, no. It's an extrapolation technique. <laughs> we count fields of view and then we extrapolate from there into a, a, a broader number. And so, you know. And we dilute uh, stuff too. We thank God sure. for dilution. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. And, and, and I it saw, just, sorry, right, sorry, go, go. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I saw someone uh, in the comments say that Elaine makes it so easy that a child could do. So, <laughs> yes, exactly that. So the, all the courses, all the process are building up on a way that doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter how acquainted you are with a microscope. If you never touched a microscope before, you can do it. So take your time and we hope to see you soon. Exactly. Yeah, it really just comes down to precision of process. It, it, we're trained on how to be very precise in our measurements and very consistent and repeatable in those processes. So that way that when we're doing a lot of soil samples for our clients, especially over time, that they can feel confident that, yeah, okay, you, my numbers are really truly kind of representative of what uh, is in the soil. Yeah, All right. I mean, I'm not that crazy person, at least I hope not, but it's easy <laughs> to spend hours in just one drop on the microscope. So just need True. time and patience. <laughs> that's, that's happened to me a few times where, you know, you forget. <laughs> And three hours later, you look up and you go, oh, no, I missed lunch. <laughs> For sure. Adam, anything you want to add before we move on to the next question? Nope, we're good to go. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen back out. Next question is from Franz, and the question is, are AM fungi passed on to the next generation within seeds? And I think this kind of is an endophyte. Um, what say you, panelists? It's not Here's normal. Oh, uh, I'll let the expert handle this one. <laughs> he knows more we than I about do about this. AM. We were about to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Elaine. That, that's how people must, if, if, if we both say it at the same time, we must be looking at what the we're sources. <laughs> there, are, there are kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, because mycorrhizal is the relationship, the root and the fungi in association. 
like orchids, I believe, have a transmission through generations like that. Um, more more of an endophytic phase, but typically it's going to be hyphae or spores or little pieces of root that are in the soil already that will then link up with the new plants roots and it usually takes about four to six weeks for that relationship to really establish in there. Yeah, and I think that's maybe a confusion spot because people hear about endophytes and so forth. They think, well, isn't arbuscular mycorrhizal an endophyte? You know, in a way, I guess, it, would you classify them as an endophyte because of the... the... Let's call yeah. it a, a really, a really small hug. <laughs> they, don't, <laughs> they don't go like completely mingle into one organism, but in the arbuscule, which is why they're called their muscular mycorrhizal fungi, the plant actually makes a little space and the fungi comes in and branches out and that's where they exchange nutrients and it's like a couple of cell walls separate them from being one organism at that point. And, and, there, and the plant does put out the exudates first to attract those fungi to grow towards and into the root system of the plant. So, uh, you know, it's not a parasitic relationship in any way um in you know in the most normal interactions that are going on you know the plant then once the fungus is inside the root or in between the cell wall and the cell membrane of the cells of the root um the hyphae are, get the message of what the plant needs and the fungus goes out and collects those nutrients or water or whatever and brings it back to the plant door-to-door -door service and so the plant gets all what it needs to grow better. The fungus gets what it needs to keep growing as well. And so then the plant puts out another exudate saying, yeah, not enough cadmium in here. And then the next trip is not enough phosphorus. And the next trip is not enough uh, potassium. And you can see why it benefits the plant so much because the plant directly gets what it needs. The fungus gets what it needs. Both grow better. And I think there is, you know, the question around the seed being is an endophyte, that type of thing. But it's really important, I think, from a seed standpoint, that once it does germinate and it does actually start to put out the exudates into the root, we're hoping that uh, brushcom mycorrhizae fungi um, are going to be present uh, in that soil profile really close to where that seed's germinating so that it can make those connections really, really early on. And, but only rarely in the real world out in, out in soil. Um, do we see the spores of the mycorrhizal fungi inside the seed coat or, you know, in between? You just, you really don't see that much. It's really once the root has, uh, the, the, that seed is germinated and the roots are growing out, now you get the mycorrhizal colonization of those root systems. Great. I think we hit that one pretty good. Anybody else want to add anything? Ronald, you good? Good to go? Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next question. And the next question is uh, from Robin. And we already talked about a little bit how we uh, do kind of a microbial analysis, but this one's going to be specific to mycorrhizae fungi. So the question is, what's the best way to quantify mycorrhizae fungi in a plant root sample? I'm trying to look at the relationships between plant growth and experimental vegetative plots and fungal connections slash abundance. Thanks from New Zealand. Okay, this one is yours. <laughs> I'm actually trying to bring up a paper I can share in chat. I think I just found it. So it takes a long time. I've spent hours and hours of my life looking through microscopes, scoring, we call it scoring roots to see the percentage of the root area that has AM fungal structures, right? And there's different ways of doing this, but um, I, so I posted this paper because the staining method I would use is what they call black ink and vinegar. There's other staining methods, but some of them have carcinogens in them and things. So that's the safest. And then you really need to, you need to ask yourself what question you're trying to answer. Because when I was in grad school, I had to answer the question like, you know, to, to, to like almost decimal places, what's the difference between these treatments? And it was to go to peer reviewers and all, and it's a very different standard. 
you may just want to say, do I have a lot or a little? <laughs> is 10% of the root colonized or is 30%, 40% colonized, right? And then tie that to what the management you're doing, what soil amendments were there, you know, all of those things. And there are ways of doing what the, is scoring what they call mycorrhizal inoculum potential, which helps you understand if there's enough propagules in your soil to colonize plants within four to six weeks, like I said. But there's a really tricky thing because I say this every time this comes up, I do not believe in commercial mycorrhizal inoculants. I have not come across one yet that I could recommend. A lot of times they're not even alive. A lot of times there's nitrogen and phosphorus in there and that's why the plants grow bigger, but people think it's the mycorrhizae. Um, I mean, maybe in the ectos, Elaine, there's some commercial products because they're very different, but in the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, I just am like, uh, I'll post another link in the chat because Rudale has found a way to propagate a local population. And then that way you can restore the, the abundance of mycorrhizae in a field by making your own instead of buying a commercial source. And that, that um, so she was just talking about, they actually um, give you the, uh, the root system, you know, little bits of the root system is what you're actually buying. And so you have to get that inoculum onto your plants ASAP so that the arbus skills inside don't die before you get them out into the field. So, um, but a much better way of getting colonization. And I think to me, ectos and endos, um, they both have kind of the same problems of getting established. And Bernal, have you done, you've done work on the mycorrhizal colonization. Do you have anything to, you know, staining techniques or measuring? No, no, I just can share what Adam just said about uh, propagules actually present in the product that you buy. Uh, most recently, I was in Nicaragua uh, for tobacco grower. And so I got a bag of those. And so I took my microscope and just tried to find some of those in there. And of course, I didn't find. And then what was fun was like the next day or two days later, comes the, the seller is coming over and I'm asking, can you tell me what is your way of counting your propagules so you make sure I have them in my bag? And the poor guy, he was just a salesman. So he said, yeah, please come to our meeting. We'll have a scientist that could answer your question. Right? So I didn't go because I was busy in the field, but yeah, fully supporting what Adam is saying. Like uh, funny powders that you buy sometimes. Yeah, I've had um, bought, you know, suspensions of of spores, and they say there's, you know, two thousand spores per um, uh, milliliter. And you pull out a couple drops on your microscope, and you can't find them. There are no spores. There, you know, and look through the hole into all the liquid in that material, and you know, if there's nobody forcing them to tell the truth, they don't seem to mind. You know, yeah, uh, doing bad things for their clients. They trust <laughs> that people know that they need mycorrhizal fungi, uh, but then they're not actually buying any mycorrhizal fungal spores in the product that they're buying. So it's a buyer's beware. You must check and make sure that the spores or the um, arbuscules are present in the sample if you have any hope that you're going to increase the mycorrhiza colonization of the whatever it is you're inoculating. Yeah, I think what you explained too about the potential pitfalls in the biological marketplace uh, is not just for, you know, AM fungi, it is in a lot of biological products. Um, we're kind of in this rapid increase of, you know, awareness around biological products and a lot of people trying to make their claim or their stake in, in the ground as far as selling products and some are good and some are not. So buyer beware for sure. Yep. That's why you need that microscope. Yep. For sure. Well, this is kind of like human nutritional supplements where yeah. there's not a good governance of the product. Yeah. So the claims are made about this will magically cure everything that's wrong with you. And usually if it claims to be a cure-all, it cures nothing. And Right. The tools of science can help us uncover the charlatanism 
out there yeah. and the quackery out there um, because people have sometimes gone in and looked at the pills that people are buying and it's like, we claim that it's X, you know? And then they are like, the genetics for that plant don't even exist in this pill. <laughs> like <laughs> there's zero percent of whatever they're saying it is. And so, right, right. yeah, buyer beware. Yeah. Yeah, critical thinking is vital, right? So just take your time, do your research, do small tests before jumping in as this is the best solution. And also yeah. try different techniques combined because it's not, uh, each area has its own characteristics. So what works for me doesn't work for my neighbor necessarily. So trial yeah. and critical thinking are crucial. And this is a point I bring up with my clients a lot, which is around why the need for testing is important, especially when they're in the transition phase or transitioning from one paradigm to another. And it, testing's expensive. There's no doubt about it. It's going to be part of the budget to, to do. But if you just use observational techniques, a lot of times they don't give you necessarily all the answers, especially when things go bad or go wrong. Um, so spend your time and your money into testing to make sure that um, you can see how the microbial community is evolving uh, and, and transitioning during that, that period. But you do want to realize that as soon as you do have the mycorrhizal fungi uh, uh, um, growing and building and increasing in uh, colonization every year, you don't have to keep adding inoculum. You, you're spreading inoculum every time you walk across that field and you get a little bit of material from over here and you're spreading the spores. You just don't want to till. Don't ever till don't do that catastrophic disturbance because you just wiped out probably just about all of your mycorrhizal fungi through one single tillage event mm -hmm. so yep don't you, you know you you took you 10 years to build things up and then you wipe it out with one one tillage right Ouch. okay yeah <laughs> i agree Ouch is right all right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, next question is from Regina. And the question is, do I need a specific fungi species to implant in my garden or can I just use the oyster, turkey or wine cap that I already have? Let's say you penless. Depends on oyster. what you're growing. <laughs> oh yeah. You go first, Elaine. I'll, I'll clean up in a second. <laughs> <laughs> You'll clean up my mess, hey? Um, Not your mess. So, <laughs> so it depends on what you're growing. Usually when you have a mixture of oyster, turkey, and wine cap, um, and every year you go out into the um, not disturbed systems that are more or less in the same stage of succession as the crops you're trying to grow, um, just collect little bits of that. The the little bits go into your compost pile. So you kill any disease causing organism. You make the habitat impossible for the diseases to grow. And so now what you've got are really good sets of microorganisms. Now the mycorrhizal spores won't have woken up when you when you go through that process, but the mycorrhizal spores aren't dangerous for you. So you know you've got a good um inoculum hopefully and you can count on your microscope whether you've got those um beneficial spores in your um, material um and lay them out on your on your soil and find out which of the mycorrhizal fungi belong to um your which what particular crop you want to grow you can go to some you know like um peter mcavoy's um, uh, book is there's a lot of information in there about what kinds of mycorrhizal fungi colonize what kind of plants and so if your plant falls in this group then yeah you need it would be a good idea to maximize the diversity of everything yeah. okay. clean uh, up for I me i want to take that one over because that's uh something that really struck me at the beginning when i first uh, started to learn and 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 deepen my knowledge like the most diverse your soil ecosystem is the more stable it is right and so then when you apply it to whatever uh, agronomic system the mindset as of today is to recreate or create a soil ecosystem which means with its all is, is diversity and that's the kind of the whole 
where the whole shit hit the, it's the fan. Sorry for my French, but <laughs> you know, it's it's going completely against the the current mindset that most universities are are trying to teach farmers and probably scientists, right? So looking at what Adam said earlier, like okay, you want to wipe the disease out? Well, then good luck, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> So how 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 is it that we create the right conditions for the our plants that will be feeding us nutrient full of nutrient? This is the challenge, and of course, like using our microscope is is a, is a good is a good tool. Uh, let's just put it this way. We had uh, another question, kind of. You know, questions I've seen in the Q&A and plus in the chat, which is around, what about mushroom spawn blocks? You know, people out there making oyster mushrooms or wine caps or turkey tails or whatever it is. Are those good sources of inoculum? And, you know, my opinion on this is that there, if you depend upon that as, as your, that's going to be your fungal biomass, you're going to try to incorporate into your soil, the diversity index is gone. I mean, you really, you're not talking about diversity. Is it okay to add them into your compost? Sure. Can you add the spawn blocks back into your soil? No problem. But the are you, your expectations as far as will that spawn block of oyster mushrooms really benefit my plants? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but diversity is more the key thing. I don't want just one species. I want hundreds of species, thousands of species. Thousands, of yeah. Yeah. And the best place to find them is the best or the closest and the best possible uh, beautiful wood that you have near you. Just go and collect some samples from the soil, not the mushrooms on the trees, because we want the mushrooms that will thrive in the soil as well. I really like what everybody says, so I'm not mopping up for me, for anybody. Um, <laughs> I have to I tease you. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to. Uh, I just have to add something. When I hear like these three commercial varieties of mushrooms, are they going to work in my soil? I'm like. Does a chihuahua and a pomeranian and a poodle join a wolf pack? Because they're related, but we've artificially selected them and kind of made, you know, the molds and stuff can take them out really quickly. And there's, there's, you know, not, you're not necessarily in the several dozen species of mushrooms that we cultivate commercially. They're, they're the strains that we use are not wild types. And that's Oops. part of what I learned from my sorghum as well, is that those wild types have a genetic reserve that makes them much more stable and robust and competitive in a, in a natural environment. In a garden, uh, mo most of the things that you're going to produce, going back to the question, are going to associate with a bunch of different arbuscular mycorrhizae. You know, I mean, even talking about species with these things is weird. They, they propagate by cloning themselves and stuff. Uh, we use all these weird terms in science like cryptic reproduction, <laughs> where we don't really understand fully how it goes on. But we also use a really fun science term called th that these fungi are promiscuous. One type of fungi will partner with a lot of different plants. And there's not the same host level of specificity. Like I think the Amanita muscaria mushroom, that's an ectomycorrhizae, it only associates with a few genus of trees. And arbuscular mycorrhiza are like, oh, a potato, oh, a tomato, oh, a grass, oh, I'm like all, all connect to this. And even different species of plants can be linked in a common network. And some really cool things are out there about what can happen when when that happens when when they link up so um make the conditions really good for your arbuscular mycorrhizae diversity reduce those disturbances these you know make sure there's enough organic matter because they're going to mine that organic matter for phosphorus to trade with the plant um don't leave a lot of fallow in your garden and if you need to pro like do something like the rodeo method to boost your population a diverse local population is the only answer that I am comfortable with. Great. All right. So let's move on to the next question. And I think Adam, what you just mentioned is going to be kind of really a follow-up to this question here, um, which is, 
In raised bed gardening, after the harvest, I use a flail mower to break up the remaining plant matter. Then I tarp to keep weeds down and let the biomass break down. Then after a few weeks, I have cleaned the, uh, I have clean soil to plant the next harvest. Am I destroying the fungi by having that period of no plants growing? And this is from Jeff. And I'll just, because this, this question kind of triggered to me what you were talking about, Adam, um, was, you know, leaving periods of time when you don't have any plants growing in the system. You can for sure have that you know, as long as you have good organic matter and you have mulch and plant residues that are going to break down, those types of things. But I've really found that having a really good um, perennial crop of plants that exist in my garden beds, as an example here, that I'm continuing that microbial engine, even when my tomato plant's done and I'm going to put some other plant in there, I have a good perennial set of plants that are growing as an understory that really keep that engine thriving in those connections um, already in place. All right, panelists, anything else you guys want to add to this? Hi. You nailed it. <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. <laughs> Wow, all right. <laughs> it didn't mean to suck the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's kind of a, it was a limited question and, you know, you, you aren't destroying the fungi, but you, if you're not careful, you could perhaps drive everything into a, a dormant stage, into the stage of spores. Um, you know, they're a little bit slower to pick up and start growing again, but um that's why perennial understory pl plants are so important to have because they'll be working in the winter under the snow in many cases as long as there's any kind of sunlight and its roots have gotten low lo long enough to be beyond the permafrost well we don't really have permafrost but you get the idea i think right yeah um i think i understand as well jeff question from a very operational point of view right which is like you know increasing the chances for his crop coming up after compared to whatever weed but um so then the trade-off is to be found how do we make both happen right in terms of operational needs what i want to add about on um, uh brian is like also if you don't have understory plant growing well you are also reducing the carbon input at root level maybe uh adam you can confirm that i'm sorry i was hunting for a paper uh that i'm gonna post in chat <laughs> about no these way. perennial about Basically. these perennial plants because it's a big topic so <laughs> please say that again and i'll pay attention fair enough, fair enough. you're multitasking aren't you <laughs> No, I was just mentioning about root exudates and carbon pumping into the soil when you just cover the whole bed or whatever surface you have, just like you're just reducing the input of carbon at, at that level, right? Which is yeah. then oh, again, sure. again another trade off to be considering, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a principle of regenerative agriculture that we try to have living roots in soil at all times or right. minimize the amount of space with bare ground because the the liquid sunlight is not going into the system through the roots if there's not something photosynthesizing right. there there was a yeah. farmer in last year's soil summit and i'm trying to remember his name um but i was really impressed that he does a lot of different like cereal crops and corn and a really wide variety of different annuals but his planting techniques, he was always constantly planting. It was as he was clearing off, he was planting into that system. And even when he had certain plants just growing up, he planted in another crop, you know, uh, into that. And it was like he was really keeping that system just moving. Even though it was full of annuals, um, he was still maintaining that good carbon pump in that system. And I was really impressed with, uh, with, with his techniques. It's essentially how any forest gets sustained over... <laughs> millennia yeah. right it's just keep constantly putting new seedlings back and forth like reynold put it clear is the exudates of the system if you're not the system is not being retroactive being fed it will start to crumble in one point it's when you start to lose biology because no one will start will starve to death so they'll find another place to go to find food <laughs> basically simple like that for sure Okay, anything else, panelists? 
All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, this question is, is there a way for us to use AM fungi or biodiversity to improve clay soil? And it's it's kind of funny. I get this question a lot where it's like, all I have is just all clay. It's, it's impossible to work with, all right? It's just pure sand. It's impossible to work with. So what do you say, panelists, about using AM fungi or just biodiversity to improve any soil, just beyond clay? Yeah. <laughs> It was an easy one. I kind of teed that one up for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting that people have that problem. They've been told all their lives that it, you've, they've got a horrible clay soil and the, the soil surface, you know, does all of the breakage and you've got a, you know, massive picture puzzle of clay, compacted clay. Um, the probability is that that is not clay. Um, I've done this several times with people that are just adamant about my I, I have clay soil it's a horrible clay soil it always compacts it always dries out it's a clay soil okay let's do a little test here so you scrape together you know a, a quarter pound of that soil and it's not really soil it's dirt and uh, put it in a in a jar that you can see the colors uh, and uh, fill the jar up with um, uh, water just beyond the, the surface of the soil. And hopefully you'll see how fast that compaction is dissolved. There's not actually anything holding those um, sand, silts, clays, and even organic matter in there. There's nothing to hold it together. So it just disintegrates in no time flat. And now shake that, give it a good shaking and put it down and let everything settle. And what people will find time after time is maybe their soil has 40% clay and 25% um, um, sand and you know whatever's left over is uh, the silt. It's only 40% clay. You've got all those other materials to play around with. What you don't have is any organic matter in there. And you can't really get these organisms doing anything for you until you feed them. Isn't that amazing? No feedy, no worky. So get the food out there, 3% organic matter, please. And you may have a whole different opinion about how awful and terrible and horrible your soil actually is. It's, you know, something completely different from what you thought you had. And it's just that chemical salesmen can make a lot more money when they're convinced the grower that theirs is a clay soil and there's nothing that they can do except do fertilizers and pesticides. Yeah, this is something that I really uh, often come across with my clients. Uh, there is this thought that one product will solve it all. And and when you start saying, yeah, what about this, 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 this and that, and then you've scared the guy away and, and then about catching it back and just like, okay, we have a solution. We can make it. We're going to rebuild your soil ecosystem. That's why for me, I mean, I, what I do is like, this is my light motive, like building soil ecosystem. It's just not a single silver bullet. Hard one. Okay. okay. Uh, so we've, I think we've covered almost everything. Elaine, you do talk in the foundation courses about certain forms of calcium that can help, you know, because on a, on a really fine scale, those little, we call them platelets sometimes, those little plates of clay will stack up and no air or water can move through. And that's why people think clay is horrible because it's just the water pools and goes away and doesn't go into the, to the system well and all. But the OM and maybe a little bit of calcium can really change the the chemical and physical properties of that of that clay pretty rapidly. And then the biology, especially things like fungi with their hyphae will make aggregates and let air and water flow through and like it's just a matter of sometimes you got to turn a ship from a real, you know, from a really broken condition to you know, and I don't think we can expect that in all places in the world, in all circumstances, in all soil types, it just goes like magic. You know, if everything lines up, soil can be regenerated really rapidly. 
but a lot of people contend with unexpected things like drought in the year that they're trying to do this. And if we put all of our hope in like, this has to happen one, one season or with one method, like, um, like we've said, you know, people are just going to be disappointed <laughs> a lot of times or think like regenerative agriculture doesn't work. You know, Elaine and Adam and Carla don't know what they're talking about <laughs> Why? because I tried it once and it didn't work. And, you know, it's, it's, it's what you've said, Renald, it's deep, detail context nuance and this is one of the reasons why we try to train consultants and have people work with consultants because i get questions sometimes like how do i get fix the weeds in my garden and i'm like what weeds what species what's the context where do you live there's all these questions and it, really you need to have a consultant come out and work with and you it, on this and it turns out it wasn't actually weeds that they were being annoyed by it was perennial plants perhaps and they called some really beautiful plants weeds because they don't want them there so we're mostly worried about those weeds that cause problems with allowing the crop you want to grow will be prevented from getting the nutrients that they need if there's the truly weedy species out there and weeds tell you a lot about what's going on in your soil chemically um, and that's perhaps what well we we'll, we need to do a really good job of explaining all that but it takes you know a good half hour to 40, 45 minutes to line up all the factors for you to think about and realize there are very easy ways to deal with assessing whether you've dealt with the problem or not and it's called, ta-da, microscope. <laughs> you know, it's something that you guys touched on as well was this kind of a knowledge gap that's out in the agricultural community. You know, when it comes down to most farmers, they feel like I have a clay soil that's compacted. I need to flocculate my soil, so therefore I put out gypsum. And I'm going to put out, you know, my recommendation is going to put out, you know, five tons of the acre of this product. And the unfortunate part of the knowledge gap is, you know, they just don't understand that there's a biological system that's going to help set the right calcium magnesium ratio to flocculate their soils for them. There's an alternative to that. And unfortunately, when they use the gypsum, they're setting back that microbial community significantly. We're never able to get that microbial community established to be able to help flocculate those soils for them. And I, I really think that the educational gap is, is one of the biggest headways that we have. Um, and that's why I think a lot of us consultants have to actually spend some time educating our clients. And it's unfortunate, not just our clients, but it's the entire support staff that goes around in, in a farm. You have to make sure the farm manager's on board, the irrigation specialist, the PCAs. Uh, you know, there's a whole litany of people that really need to understand what we're trying to do from a biological standpoint. And so I think the knowledge gap is, is a, a challenge for us. Um, but over time, I think that, that, that those doors will be getting broken down, especially when more of the universities really start to embrace these practices and the agronomists who are coming out of, you know, the, the colleges are going to have some more of that knowledge and the work that we're doing here in the school, you know, providing a uh, uh, closure to that, to that knowledge gap. Yeah, actually, Brian, what you said is exactly the line of thoughts that they have when they're building dirt roads or secondary roads is how can we increase compaction to a level that no water will pass through so it's just add more clay add gypsum add all this okay. line of things and compact everything and you are good to go so we just have to do the opposite direction so the knowledge is there we just need to transform and adjust to what we need to do in the field so sci i love science for a reason <laughs> for sure Okay, let's move on to the next question. Um, this question is from Katya, and this question is, is it possible to transplant mycorrhizae fungi from more natural established environments, e.g. old growth forests, to a garden bed or a field, almost like a sourdough starter for bread, but for plant fungal interactions? You don't have the right kinds of mycorrhizal fungi in old growth forests. Those are all ectomycorrhizal um, colonizers on the uh, conifers um, or on the evergreen 
uh, plants, uh, not the right kind of mycorrhizal fungi, because in uh, your garden and with the vegetables, with the grasses, um, with the, even some of the shrubs will have um, the uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So you would want to go to the late successional grass, highly productive perennial grass systems um, or things like corn, wheat, um, you know, those stage of succession is going to be very high in the mycorrhizal fungi that you need for the veggies you want to grow. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's find the right ecosystem that matches the type of plant you're trying to grow um, and definitely pull you know, from the humus, the roots that are in that area to try to be able to get some of that inoculum. That's a real common, you know, practice for us to be able to get those indigenous microorganisms back into play. It's just like if you were doing fruit trees, if, if you were doing trees, then yeah, you're going to move more into a tree system than you would from a, like a grassland. But if you're doing annual crops, then look more in the grasslands. All right, Palace, say, go ahead, Adam. I would often say like a, a diverse perennial grassland is going to have a good population from your eco region um, that can go a lot of different directions and partner with a, a broad range of plants. Uh, we got the question in chat about like, you know, if you're using local populations of AM fungi, but we have all these introduced or non native species like maybe tomatoes in Europe, how do they, how does that work? They typically do like the, you know, deep in the evolutionary history of these fungi, they maintain the the capacity to switch to a lot of different plant partners. Now, sometimes, interestingly, what we find is that when you take this fungi and introduce it to this plant, it might take them a while of being in association before the fungi become really beneficial. It's like they have to get to know each other. It's a new relationship. They have to learn the ins and the outs. And then, and then cooperation goes up over time. Um, but, you know, it's it's pretty rare circumstances that mycorrhizae would harm uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae would harm a plant. It's pretty rare circumstances, so I'm I'm not concerned. Now, do, please don't go out though and rip up like the one percent of the tall grass prairie that exists right. in North America <laughs> to inoculate your garden. This is where things like the Rodale Institute method can help us take a very small soil sample and then keep propagating that to get more um, spores. Yeah, and once you know you have it in your own garden beds, right, then you can mm -hmm. pull the roots from certain plants in your mm -hmm. garden beds and add them into your compost pile so the spores are going to be able to get propagated. So, yep. And, you know, if, if you've done that for a while and you're getting good levels of the mycorrhizal spores um, to grow, and usually you can tell on mycorrhizal spore because it's um, a fairly much bigger, it's fairly big, it's larger. <laughs> Try some English, Elaine. Um, it's wider diameter. It's typically a brown from, you know, kind of a light brown up to all the way through to that 70% cocoa chocolate color. So if you're seeing those kinds of spores, you can pretty much feel confident that you've got the other more typical spore that we can't differentiate from any other spore that's out there. So build up your your own um, your your own um, compost, you know, with lots and lots of soils around your property, and then you could start selling that. You could sell that material as an inoculum of local indigenous species of mycorrhizal fungi. We need well, remember, we need that. to grow a host plant in the compost, though. You're not the the, the mycorrhizae don't have saprophytic capacity. The, the things that are spores will remain spores. So right. if you're using something to inoculate, you're you're just you're you're spreading the spores throughout that compost material, and then you're applying it to the soil. Absolutely. But one of the things yeah. I loved about your example in the FCs, what was the place called? The the park that was redone? Governor's Island. Governor's Island. Oh, yeah. yeah. That that they actually grew plants on top of the finished compost. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, those plants are feeding the mycorrhizal fungi. So 2000 spores can become 2 million in mm -hmm. those circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you I could, like that. Yeah. yeah. 
it's a good yeah, technique, go I think, of of growing. I've seen a number of of I have a number of clients that actually do that, where will grow in a mother culture essentially, and it's it's a it's a good technique to keep on propagating. Um, and plus, I, I just love it. The plants are feeding <laughs> the compost. Without right? being mean, <laughs> but already being mean, if we have CTP students, before doing this, talk with your mentor first to just <laughs> sure. brainstorm the next steps. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. There's a part of, you know, we're educating on processes and techniques, and but then beyond that, there are ways to enhance that for sure learn the basics first <laughs> i like that okay uh let's move on to another question um this question is from uh Janaki. i hope i got that right um is it practical to establish am fungal associations in potted nursery plants perennial and woodsy species nursery managers have told me there isn't time or space in the pot for these beneficial relationships to develop <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> if the plant can grow and put out roots then and you've got mycorrhizal spores in the system that you know will make that beneficial beneficial relationship the the, the answer is yes you're you go ahead do it um you want to be careful about um you know having too small a pot because um you I mean, if the roots grow down and they start um, ring, you know, doing the ring around the bottom. Right. That's fairly deadly for the plant, regardless of it whether it's mycorrhizal or not. Yeah, they get root bound. I think but it's yeah, time my... to change the nursery, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I've I've had a couple of nursery clients, um, and you know, I, I, I my opinion has always been this, whenever there's an opportunity to inoculate the root zone with good mycorrhizal or any kind of organisms, microbial organisms, we should be doing that. Um, you know, I, I think there's always an opportunity to enhance uh, the plants. And from a nursery standpoint, I think it's a huge benefit. You know, nurseries are always dealing with the, the amount of plants that just don't make it, they die off, they're not very resilient. If somebody takes them home, forgets to water them for a day or two and the plant just crashes. Well, what if they had more resilient plants? There was more aggregation in that soil that could hold more water for longer, all those kind of things. I would think from an inertia standpoint, it'd be a huge benefit. So anything else, panelists, you guys want to add to that question? All right. Next question is from Ross. And the question is, we have a macadamia farm harvesting each season disturbs the very tops of the soil, approximately three harvests each season. It's cover cropping, maintaining ground cover and composting practices enough to reestablish and maintain all the important fungi in the soil. Let's see you panelists. Okay, maybe, um... Adam, we need to cover, cut this up. You get to take the first thing, I'll take the second, and then all together on the last. Yeah, so it's really interesting. This is sort of about like how to mitigate a disturbance. We know mm -hmm. that they're causing a disturbance. And also they're, they're primarily growing one species. And so, you know, one of the things I would say is, well, if they're maintaining ground cover, that's, you know, I, I don't see your, your, there is, some of the fungi are going to be more sensitive to disturbance than others. You may see a reduction in diversity, but that doesn't mean that the system doesn't have still a huge capacity yeah. for fungal richness. And so when you say composting, I think, well, is that like biocomplete composting? Is that something that is fungal dominant? Um, I'd also want to do a little bit more research on macadamia trees, see what some of their key fungal mutualisms are, but I, it doesn't strike me as impossible. There's some challenges here, but it, you know, I think, I think almost any system it's about, you got like, I've said this a few times. It's like, you got to figure out how to bake your own pizza, right? We can give you ideas and say these things can help these things can help you got to figure out what you can operationalize to do that and and you're going to need a microscope to start looking at 
this fungi and saying, did, 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 it, did it really get knocked back? Did the fungal forest like get chopped down by what I did? Or am I improving it over time? Those kind of things. So that's a, that's a whole lot of stuff that it could have been summarized in. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite terminology, it depends. I deal with this a lot in almonds. Um, so I, I don't know if macadamia harvesting is similar to almonds, but you know, in almonds, uh, they right now, because of the way they harvest, and this is a management practice issue really, uh, because of the way they harvest, they need to have bare floors. Uh, they, they shake nuts off the trees onto a bare floor. They have sweepers that sweep all those nuts into the middles of the rows and then let them dry out for a period of time frame. And then they have vacuum cleaners essentially that come up and suck up all the nuts off the row. If there's too much debris in the understory, then it causes problems with their harvesting techniques. Uh, and this is a challenge in the almond industry that you know we've had a lot of discussions about, which is it's a management practice issue that's preventing us from really uh, doing good with soil food web kind of techniques. So some things we do, um, and one of my almond uh, clients, we do plant a cover crop and we plant them only in the middles. So underneath the trees is still bare, but at least in the middle of the row, we have a cover crop that we do a crimp and roll uh, afterwards. And all crimp and roll is, is basically how do we terminate those cover crops and lay them down like a thatch. So they become like a um, you know mulch uh, across the top of the soil. But the key component for us is that we spray a compost extract over the top of that now crimped and rolled uh, product in the hopes that by the time we get to harvest that enough of that material has been broken down into humus and now going to get reincorporated back into the soil. So we are making steps forward because we are having some living systems not having to always bear and you know trying to get the organisms in there. But the expectations from my clients are that it's going to take a long time for us to try to establish a really healthy soil food web because of the whole bare floor situation that's there. So can we make progress? Sure. But it's not like in one growing season, we're going to turn this around because they keep on putting sterilants underneath the trees that are going to be impacting the, you know, the biology. So it is a, an expectation setting thing. Now, long haul, what the almond industry is really thinking about is how do we change the harvesting technique so we don't have to drop them onto a bare floor and then sweep them? Can we trap and collect them without having to have that bare floor? And there are techniques that are coming out. And I think once we establish that, change that management practice, then we'll have much better success in that almond industry uh, as far as establishing a good soil food web. That was my high I, I, have, I have students <laughs> in Brazil that they're using something similar for other crops, like for example, uh, corn and everything. So they're putting another uh, cover crop in between the rows. And like you explained, Brian, putting some extract and using as a mulch. And the soil food web doesn't feel much when you have the heavy equipment coming and harvesting everything. But I totally agree with you. The data shows that it takes longer to establish. But once it's established, the, this disturbance, as long as you have the management adapted for your needs, it becomes minimal. So it's a matter of time. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Okay, anything else, uh, panelists, before we move on? Yeah, okay. I, have, I oh, recently go ahead, got on. contacted by a avocado grower in Peru. And so the same question kind of applied. And one of my question i mean actually is like how do we actually increase the fungal diversity of the soil if we have a limited kind of variety of crops growing on the soil and mostly when you think about um very low no very yeah very low carbon to nitrogen ratio inside the crops that you're growing like cover crops are not that high in lignin which means okay are you actually feeding what kind of, of population of fungi you are actually feeding when you do that, then next step was like, okay, well, if we need to recreate some sort of a tree system looking like what it, it is in nature, where does the macadamia tree grow? What is this, the surroundings? Do you need to put some bushes? Do you need to put some, I don't know, vines, stuff like this. So then you actually uh, moving the system forward and then probably recreate the ecosystem that would just like make those those fungi grow 
And then the last question for me is like, okay, you have established a monoculture, right? So how do you then retrofit that into some sort which it looks like some sort that we could call syntropic forest or like natural ecosystems, which is like the whole challenge, right? How to retrofit the existing monocultural mindset and existing systems, right? So we can make this biology thrive. I agree with you. The whole monoculture aspect is is extraordinarily problematic. And any time that we can introduce multi-species into a system is such a benefit. You know, we've made some pretty good progress, I think, in vi vineyards, um, where in the understory of vineyards, we plant a lot of different perennial types of late successional grasses um, into the system. And, and that we definitely see good responses uh, from that. And, and not just one, you know, I always tell them, folks, put 15 different seeds out there, different types, see what sticks. If we can get two or three to stick the first time, and then we can get three or four more species to, to establish, and we get a very diverse set of understory, then we're really in kind of on the right path. Um, so I agree with you. It, it's, a, it's a problem in a lot of the tree crop. Vine is, is really still very monocultured in, in, in mindset. And it doesn't have to be. Really, in those, a lot of those systems, especially if you don't have the harvesting problems, you should be having a ton of different diversity under story plants. Uh, okay, so th this might be a little bit out on a limb. <laughs> Go for it. Everybody Never say that now. <laughs> there is this tension I feel all the time in these kind of situations where I'm like, we need to challenge and inspire you to do more regenerative practices than you are currently doing to move the bar towards less disturbance, more diversity, all these things. How that gets in, especially inside of like, you know, I follow a regenerative ag group online and sometimes it gets really like this echo chamber happens because of tribalism and people are like, you're a filthy non-regenerative person because you put a little of this into your system or you didn't stop this or whatever. And it's like, it's, it's tribalism again, it's that bias. And so I like to call that out and even say shocking things. Elaine, close your ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell a farmer that they need to stop using herbicides. They know how, how their use of herbicides go. I'm going to challenge them to reduce their use of herbicides, to go to different herbicides, to look at the way that herbicides disrupt the soil food web and then make their own conclusion. They are responsible for their land. It is not my job or anyone's job in regenerative agriculture to say, here's your prescription, do this, because that is a recipe for disaster. So you're one of us if you're trying. This is a pluralistic space. You're here trying to make a more regenerative system. And we're trying to give you tools to inspire you. But you are you get to be one of us, even if you're not 100% the way we do it here. I just wanted to say that. It's an knowledge gap problem. You know, that's the, once they understand the mechanisms, they really then start focusing on, should I, I shouldn't be putting herbicides down. I should find an alternative to this, right? And it, you're right. I think it's them making that those conclusions and and you know closing that knowledge gap. I, I beautifully said. Okay, next question. Yep. All right. Uh, next question is from Mark, and it's I currently work in forestry and have been using the information from the agricultural community to bring it to the forestry industry. I know plants need somewhat different fungi and biotic makeup of soils than that of trees. I'm wondering if you can touch on the differences between trees and crops. Um, I think I would just say to this person that he needs to take the foundation courses. Because this is, ooh, all the differences between trees and crops. Well, to me, a lot of time, trees are crops. So you've got an orchard or, you know, you're going to sell um, Christmas trees or whatever. So you have to do follow the same kind of approach that you do with any other plant. So, yeah, foundation course for this guy. For sure. I mean, it's all there's there's so many mechanisms, you know, mm -hmm. uh, around how the microbial community changes from the different types of plants growing in that system. 
um, and needing to identify and understand those differences. Um, Successional, uh, you know, mm -hmm. fungal yeah. to bacterial ratios. There's a lot of different things that we have to, to really comprehend. Essentially, the principles are the same. It's just to have to understand the need of your tree to adjust all your amendments or your practices to reach the desired point. But yeah, and the best rock, we can stay hours here, right? Talking about this question. <laughs> yep. It's true. Yeah, that's um, that, that's a good point. It, it's, it, again, a knowledge gap kind of thing. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, that's what it requires. Okay, shall we move on to the next question? I think this will be the last question we'll probably get to today. Oh, shoot, I have to refresh. Sorry, folks. All right. Let me go back. There we go, right here. Brian, every time you do this, you're going to have to sing a song for us as punishment. <laughs> oh, no, that's punishment for all of you. <laughs> if you want me to sing a song. <laughs> Okay, uh, this one's from Brooke, and Brooke is, how would one farm in a fungi-friendly way while growing and harvesting baby greens that have to be harvested small and they have high turnover? Something like a market garden kind of thing where we, disturbance is definitely going to be part of the equation. Well, I, I, I can take a crack at this to start yeah. with. Um, you know, the, it, it, I have a number of market gardeners that are our clients, and for sure, there's a high amount of, of I guess, disturbance maybe is too strong of a word, but there's a lot of turnover. You're, you're constantly kind of going through those harvesting techniques, I, you just making sure that you keep on planting into those systems um, and then leaving roots in when you can. So if you're harvesting baby greens, you don't need to pull the whole entire plant out. In fact, most people, when they harvest greens, they don't do that. They cut and leave the roots in there. Um, so whenever you have the ability to leave roots in the system, I'm a big I'm a proponent for that. If you're pulling something like beets or carrots or other things where you have to remove them from the ground, you're going to be causing disturbance. But, you know, I'd say once you pulled, then get plants back into that system. It's just keep on having plants growing in that system is, is a really, really important thing. Yep. And leave the carrot tops in the, uh, you know, lay that on the soil surface and you'll find out real easy way to know whether you've got the right biology or not is how fast does the carrot tops decompose if uh, you know the those um the plant material that you took off in the field is sitting there for you know the next two months no decomposition has happened at all you'll know that it's time to get the composter out and um, make some extracts and and teas and get the proper biology back in the system because you've lost it somehow think through how you lost it um, so you get a lot of information out of the organic matter that you add back into the system by never removing it, it goes right back out there and you want want to realize that you know as we go through succession there is a shift in that fungal to bacterial ratio as you're moving through those different stages. And so you can figure if you're growing um, um, vegetables of some kind, that the fungal to bacterial biomass ratio is going to be somewhere around 0.5 to maybe 0.85. Um, and if you want to then start growing a highly different crop, you know, now you want you want to put in um, uh, um, plants that require a 0.3 ratio of fungi to bacteria. You're going to have to do something to alter the amount of fungi you have in the system. So what predators or um, pushing the bacterial food even more. There's lots of different ways you can go around making those shifts occur. So um I think yeah, yeah, you've got to you've got to be thinking about the whole system as you're you're going through these changes. Yeah, market gardens are incredibly hard to manage because you you're constantly doing these little you know what crops going in where it's all about timing putting it in there. Um, yeah, I I applaud a lot of market gardeners out there from their you know efficiency of of organizing their their plots because it's complicated. But you can see why they went to larger and larger size scale. <laughs> All of this 
instead of a quarter of an acre this three four acres is going to become and then you reduce the diversity in your crop plants too but right. you have to maintain that um, diversity in the biology in your soil so understory crops um, are um, a, a good nut thing to be thinking about perennial cover plants yep yeah, i agree yep. thank you perennial <laughs> no worries okay panels anything else you want to add before we close uh today's session nope okay carla and adam you guys are good all right just, yeah we just need more time that's it hey, that's it right we should do the four hour webinars no, i'm just kidding just kidding hey, hey, I'll, 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 I'll reach out to you all and we'll have an even nerdier discussion in a few days <laughs> there you go <laughs> Okay, so uh, in closing, I want to just uh, make sure everybody is informed again about our webinar three, which is going to be next Wednesday, April 26th at 11 a.m. Pacific time frame. And this is with Nicole Masters, and she's going to be talking about a case study from the Cottonwood Ranch in the northern Nevada desert. Uh, so this is, should be a really, really informative um, uh, information that Nicole is going to share with us. And then webinar four is the fungal farming experts meet the fun guys and gals. Uh, this is going to be on Saturday, April 29th at 11 a.m. Pacific. And this is where you get to hear from folks like myself and Ronald who are actually doing the work out in the field and what is our relationship with the fungal community for sure. Okay. Um, and with that being said, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists um, so thank you, Adam and Carla and Renald for all the work that you guys are doing. And of course, Elaine, um, you have been a huge inspiration to all of us and a mentor. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this information. And I'd also like to thank our support staff. There are a lot of people behind the scenes that actually do this, uh, put together these webinars for us. It is a huge undertaking. So thank you. Thank you so much for the support staff. And I also like to thank our audience. I tell you what, today, fantastic amount of questions that were really on point, uh, really dealing with fungi. So you guys were really uh, cl uh, clued in and great, great questions. So, so that's my thanks. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Brian. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, thank you everyone. Time just flies. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you guys in a week. Enjoy. <laughs> Ciao. Bye. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.